Hello, I'm Dr. Christopher Garneau. I am a professor of, associate professor of sociology at the University of Science and Arts of Oklahoma. I'm very pleased to be able to speak with you at this conference and also pleased to be bringing some original research along with me. So the, uh, the name of this project is Rethinking Structural Cognition and Religion, White Christian Nationalism and Views of Racial Inequality. So I started, I'm a, primarily a sociologist of religion, and as such, I'm very interested in the ways in which religion shapes our attitudes and behaviors. And so today we're going to be thinking about uh, this intersection of structural cognition, which is the ability to think about social realities in a structural rather than individualistic way. It's uh, of primary concern to sociologists because most Americans are very individualistic and, and thought to or taught to think individualistically rather than structurally. So what I'll be examining today is how one specific form of religion and specifically the ideology of Christian nationalism among white Americans affects views of racial inequality. In other words, how do we make sense of it? And this is something that sociologists have thought about for a long time. We often refer to this as a legitimating rationale. In other words, we need a ration, rational reason or a rationale to tolerate or even defend structures of inequality. And we see this all throughout history. Um, and religion has played a fundamental and primary role in defending inequality. Uh, we see it within slave states, we've seen, seen it within feudal states, uh, and even within uh, modern epochs of capitalism. Along the way, we find different ways in which different religions have been used uh, in theology, and um, the scope of religion has been used to justify a certain type of inequality. So let's go ahead and start with Emile Durkheim, one of the what we call founders of sociological study. So Durkheim was highly concerned with how we see this thing called the social, which we later understood to be the field of sociology. Scholars, academics, philosophers up until this point were largely unconcerned with the social because it, it doesn't seem like it exists. I mean, if you think about it this way, you know, it's why does water not appear to the fish or, you know, you can't see the forest through the trees. If you're in society, it's hard to see what society is. You actually have to back up and pull out from a larger scope, um, a bird's eye view, so to speak, to be able to actually see what society looks like. So Durkheim is really interested in the role of religion in understanding the social, that, that religion impacts things in very important ways. And uh, some of his earliest writings and most profound writings looked at how uh, Protestants and Catholics were really different uh, in, in terms of how they viewed money, how they viewed capitalism, and how that impacted the different decisions that they made and the different attitudes that they took on. So today, religious scholars in kind of in the, the same vein as, Ver, uh, as Durkheim, find that religion impacts a variety of attitudes. So for example, sex and gender, the role of women and men in families, in workplaces, in educational institutions, uh, the views of, or how religion impacts views of LGBTQIA plus individuals. So how, you know, what are the roles of churches? What are the roles of families? How are we redefining what family is? Um, views of politics and government. Do we want a lot of government, a little bit of government? Um, you know, we have debates all the time on, uh, you know, it, it, is our religion compatible with liberal, conservative, or, you know, another kind of ideology that's completely off of the scale. These things are highly intertwined. And today I want to focus on another uh, dimension that religion impacts, which is race and ethnicity. And this has been documented uh, for decades. We've been looking at the ways that religion impacts views of race and ethnicity. Okay, so let's talk about structural uh, structural cognition and racial inequality. So as I was discussing legitimating rationales, uh, legitimating rationales ha have to be there for any kind of inequality, including racial inequality. How do we explain that inequality exists in 2021 when we have institutions um, that are bound by the law and we have you know, uh, constitutional rights that are in place in effect for people? Why is there still inequality? And so Americans have to reconcile this issue. And there's 
you know, a lot of data that supports differences in ways in which we understand inequality in general, um, along with religion, which I'll get to in a little bit. But there are two basic categories of ex explanations that Americans tend to rely on in explaining inequality. So first are individualistic explanations. And these are, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say more preferred, but I, I think in some ways uh, these kinds of explanations tend to lend themselves well to indiv individuals who tend to think of themselves just as individuals, as not part of a larger social structure. So probably a more older and antiquated form of individual explanation that is, I'm going to show in a little bit, decreasing amongst Americans, but has not gone away, are biological explanations. And that's the idea that inequality stems from biological differences between people. Uh, if anyone's ever heard of the book The Bell Curve by Herstein and Murray, that was kind of this idea that we're born with an IQ. Our parents, you know, give us that IQ and then we take that IQ and then we make of the, of the world what we can. We make as much money as we can or get as, as successful as we can, have a, as happy of a life as we can, but we're limited by our IQ, which is then inherited, which we then pass on to our children. And that's why there's intergenerational poverty and also intergenerational wealth, right? That's that biological explanation. Uh, lots and lots of research has countered this. Uh, and, and while I won't say that, you know, we don't inherit traits, it completely discounts the idea that we exist within a social structure and that those traits, as strong as they may be, um, may not be all, all that impactful when it comes to understanding a, the implications of a social structure. So that's the first individual explanation. An, an individual explanation that carries a little bit more weight in American society is the cultural explanation. And those typically boil down to motivational differences based on cultural influence. In other words, the culture that you're raised in impacts uh, you know, the, the motivation that you have. So if you've ever heard the term Protestant work ethic, you know, that's used over and over again to explain Midwesterners. A Midwesterner, I'm a Midwesterner. We, we love it. Uh, it's this idea of, oh yeah, I'm from the Midwest. We work hard. We put everything we can into it. And that was, you know, if you read Max Weber, that's where that Protestant, uh, the Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism, that's where that idea comes from. But people really, you know, a lot of people buy into this, this idea that motivation is a, uh, a, a large way to explain why some people have more than others. Some are just motivated more. And the cultural explanation is interesting because it also kind of lets people off the hook when they want to use a blame the victim approach. So, well, it's not necessarily that person's fault. It's just that they were raised in a specific culture and that culture either uh, encourage them to work hard or to not work hard. But again, what it really does is it lays blame on at the feet of the people uh, who are falling on hard times because it really says that, you know, it, it's kind of the bootstraps argument. If you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you'll be doing fine. So it seems a little bit lighter than the biological argument, or it seems more palatable to Americans because the biological argument seems to be at odds with, you know, a, a fundamental idea of, of equality. Well, cult, a cultural explanation still allows for equality of opportunity. If you believe that everyone has the same opportunity in, in the United States for an education and to get a good job and do those things, then you can use that cultural explanation to say why you are or are not succeeding. So those are individualistic explanations. Structural explanations are things that they're not foreign to Americans at all. And I'll show that here in the data here in just a little bit, but it's something we focus more on in sociology and in other behavioral sciences, other social sciences. Um, and structural explanations fall into two, uh, two subcategories. So the first are institutional, and that is that there are institutions like schools, hospitals, um, labor markets, labor unions, uh, governments, families, and these institutions are inherently unequal. And the inequality is set up in a litigious way, meaning it is uh, legally there. So the, there is a structure to the law that in, uh, that, that creates inequality. The example I, I, I use in a lot of my classes has to do with the criminal justice system. So if you look at the, the sentencing disparities between drugs, they're just massive and, and we've, we've changed them a little bit, but, uh, the one that we've talked about, uh, that, that was changed was the, diff the discrepancy between powder cocaine and crack cocaine, which used to be a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity that, had traditionally and disproportionately hurt people of color and poor people in general um, because affluent people and a lot of times white people were using powder cocaine, which carried far 
fewer mandatory minimum sentences. Uh, that ratio was decreased to 18 to 1, but still stands there as a major difference, which has incredible implications for who becomes incarcerated and is now involved in the criminal justice system and who is not. So institutions have a lot to do with inequality because we are subject to the laws. Um, if you look at the current housing crisis, um, a lot of the laws are just skewed towards landlords and skewed against renters. And there's not much you can do about it without changing those, those laws. And those laws tend to keep people in substandard housing and in a perpetual cycle of poverty, right? So that's one another example of how institutions can uphold inequality. Another structural explanation is historical. So historical factors res results uh, in uh, uh, current discrimination in things like jobs and housing. Um, if we want to think about how wealth accumulation, history matters a lot. So the fact that white men originally were the only intersection of individuals who are allowed to own land is highly uh, important when you think about the number one way that we gain, we uh, gain wealth is through land inheritance. 80% of all wealth is inherited amongst Americans. So um, you can see how some individuals have a lot more advantage relative to others. Okay, so let's bring religion into this argument a little bit. And the one group I want to focus on today are evangelical Protestants. I'm not going to get into a definition of evangelical Protestants, but it's in the name. Uh, they evangelize. Um, they are Christians, so they believe that Jesus is uh, Lord and Savior, um, and you, they have to have a, re, uh, a, a spiritual rebirth, be born again in the Spirit. So that's the basic criteria, um, kind of three-tier criteria we use for evangelical Protestants. So what was... Um, Observed about evangelicals uh, amongst predominantly Christian Smith, uh, he's a sociologist of religion, was that evangelicals tend to employ anti-structuralist cognition. It's not just that they're individualistic in the way that they see the world, they're actually anti-structural. They're not, it's not that they just can't see structure, they don't want to see structure. They really do not like structural explanations for inequality. So in a book called Divided by Faith about race and Christianity, Emerson and Smith propose that white evangelicals have a difficult time with structural explanations of racial inequality. And it's for good reason. If you think about, you know, the, the ways that evangelicals have understood religion, have been raised to think about religion, um, they f focus on a few prohibitive factors that prohibit them from thinking in a structural way. Number one, individualism. So that is really important for the evangelical, what I'll call toolkit. So the toolkit that even, or cultural toolkit that evangelicals use. To gain salvation, you, and under, under this toolkit, you as an individual have to choose Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. Your structure doesn't do it for you. Um, the way that you're raised doesn't do it for you. It's something that you as an individual have to do yourself. It takes the, you have to do all the work. So in other words, there are no larger structures that are pushing you one way or the other. Um, and you know, you may have a situation where you could think, well, yeah, I was born in this country and more people are Christian. So maybe I had a better chance, but still ultimately it's up to you. Your salvation is in your own hands. So that individualism in and of itself that's that's kind of baked into the theology really pushes this idea that you do everything yourself. But also relationalism. So um, the idea is that in order to have a good life, you have to have good relations. So you need um, to have good relationships with friends, with family. Um, you need to rely on those people and those people need to rely on you. And if you're falling on hard times, you know, that's kind of the thing that you need to rely on. Do you have a faith community? Are you using your faith in a, in, in a way that can um, help uh, help you out of hard times? So a lot of times evangelicals will use that relationalism to say if maybe, you know, there's something wrong with not necessarily that you're doing Christianity wrong or you're doing faith wrong. It's just that maybe you're not putting your priorities where they need to be. Maybe you need to trust more in God. And so it's also uh, in some ways kind of a judgmental way of thinking about others with regard to faith. So that's the first component that it's prohibitive for evangelicals to think structurally. The second is this idea that God created all humans equally. And this is something that Christian Smith found um, when he did this study first, and he's using the same variables that I am. Um, what he noticed is 
you know, if we look at an individualistic biological explanation, evangelicals don't prefer that. Um, in, in large part, evangelicals don't look at individuals as being created inherently different um, from a biological level. So they don't think that, you know, for, we're going to look at differences in, in wealth by black and white Americans. For evangelicals, they, they didn't support that. That didn't seem to be a, a thing for them, especially when you start controlling for things like um, geographic region and age and those kinds of things. So they really do believe uh, in large part that God created all humans equally. And that's really important, by the way, uh, that equality of opportunity, if you're going to be able to decide for yourself whether or not you want Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior to be saved, right? You, it, there has to be an equal playing field in order for that to work. It's, it's very much like the American economic system in that sense. And then the third component is that the, that the United States is essentially fair in modern times. And so evangelicals will say, yes, we had slavery, and yes, we had the Jim Crow South, and yeah, we had a lot of past history there that was unfortunate and unequal, but we've remedied that. And in current modern times, these are things we don't need to worry about anymore because, and, and I'm not saying all evangelicals feel this way, but as a whole, that was in the interviews and the qualitative work, that's what really came out, um, was that they believe that the United States is a great place. It's a fair place. So let's think about these, these three components um, that that evangelicals tend to buy into. This creates a problem of arithmetic because when you ask the question, why is there a difference between white and black wealth in the United States? In other words, you know, why why do we see different levels of income, different levels of family wealth between white families and black families? Really large, persistent differences. Well, let's think about their toolkit. What resources did they have to draw from? Well, it creates this formula. So created equally plus fairness in society. So all humans are created equal. Society is a fair place, but the outcome is inequality. So what can replace that question mark? So for them, the only reasonable explanation is culture. It's the motivation issue. Well, it's an equal place. Again, we don't see structure. Um, it's all individualistic. Uh, society's fair. We're all created the same. So the only reasonable explanation, therefore, is the cultural explanation of inequality. Because again, they're highly anti-structuralist in their cognition. It's something that um, in Christian Smith's interviews, most evangelicals were not even willing to entertain. That there's some kind of historical or institutional form of racism that can explain these things. Okay, well, here's what I want to do a little bit differently in this study. I wanted to focus on, not on evangelicals, but I wanted to focus on uh, Christian nationalism. And Christian nationalism has really become, what would I say, uh, maybe not, yeah, I guess popular in academic sociological study in the past few years. And a lot of it had to do with the election of Donald Trump. Um, there are a lot of studies that show that Christian nationalism, particularly white Christian nationalism, um, has profound influences for politics in America, but also for a lot of social issues. So let's talk about what Christian nationalism is. Um, and so I got, hold on real quick. The nice thing about recording is you get to fix anything that uh, had a typo. <laughs> so this was 2020. Whitehead and Perry uh, described Christian nationalism as an ideology that proposes the U.S. as being special because of an inextricable link to Christianity. So let's talk about what that means in, let's break it down into real language. So Christian nationalism is more of an ideology that has adherence. And, you know, I may talk about Christian nationalists, but really what I'm talking about are individuals who adhere to Christian nationalism, such as to be a real, like a Christian national, uh, someone who adheres to Christian nationalism may believe that um, it's very important to be American, to also be Christian. In order to be a true American, you also need to be a Christian. Um, Christian nationalism proposes that U.S. laws be based off of Christian theology and Christian doctrine. Um, so they would support things like prayer in school. Uh, they would support uh, things like t taking um, uh, in any edict from the Bible and instituting that into law. Um, maybe even going so far as Christianity should be the national religion of the United States, that we should have um, prayer in public schools, that during football games, we should have um, 
you know, Christian statues on uh, the courthouse lawns, those kinds of things. So in other words, uh, highly skeptical of the, the, the separation of church and state. They, they truly believe that the United States is a special place because it was blessed as a Christian nation and will be better off if we adhere to those Christian principles. Okay, that is different than evangelical Protestant um, ideology. And there's a reason why evangelical Protestants and Christian nationalists in a lot of cases kind of got squished together. Um, and it's because a lot of evangelical Protestants are Christian nationalists. But what we like to do as sociologists is control for different constructs. So in other words, if you were to control for Christian nationalism or for evangelical Protestantism, maybe we find something that's unique about both of these different ideas, because one is an affiliation, evangelical um, Protestant affiliation, and another is a more of a political ideology really than a religious ideology. Christian nationalism really has to do with views of government and politics in general. Evangelical Protestantism does not. Um, it really is just in a theological category that highly correlates with views on politics and government, but is unique as a unique feature in its own. So the reason I want to study Christian nationalism with regard to structural cognition of racial equality, inequality is that Christian nationalism often involves issues of race based on strong in and out group sentiments. So Whitehead and Perry, um, one of the things that they found is that Christian nationalists tend to be somewhat distinct in some of their views. So for example, uh, more likely to believe that immigrants to the United States are likely to increase crime. Now that in and of itself doesn't say anything to do with race, but there are some buzzwords in there for Christian nationalists. And when given different survey questions that do deal with race specifically, so for example, how much do you support interracial marriage? We see that Christian nationalists score pretty low relative to the rest of the country. The more you adhere to Christian nationalism, the less likely you are to think it's okay for interracial marriage or to support interracial marriage. So there are important correlates that we know already where Christian nationalism affects race. And it might be an interesting question, like, why, like, where does that come from? Why is that? And it has a lot to do with these moral boundaries, um, in and out group type stuff. So in and out group, group sentiments that are really based off of these moral boundaries. And for Christian nationalism, one part of the ideology is that some things are moral and some things are immoral. And it all starts with the family. So like the family is the basis of it. So, you know, marriage is really important. Marriage is really sacred. Who's in the country? Who's not in the country? Um, nationalism. All of these things are, are very important to that core. So... Whitehead and Perry argue that many factors attributed to evangelical uh, that are attributed to evangelical affiliation are better explained by adherence to Christian nationalism. You know, one of the things that they found is that religious commitment actually increases tolerance and support for groups like those who immigrate to the United States. When, once you disentangle Christian nationalism, what that means for a lot of evangelical Protestants is on face value, it might seem that evangelical Protestants might be less supportive of immigration until you account for, well, there are a lot of, a lot of evangelical Protestants who are not Christian nationalists. So what happens for those individuals who have high levels of religious commitment, but don't have that nationalism aspect to it? Well, it turns out um, that they are likely to actually you know, think very, very differently than Christian nationalists. So what I want to investigate in this particular study is whether or not this is true for structural cognition. How do evangelicals, and we, and we know from work on Christian Smith, evangelicals tend to support individualistic explanations of inequality and to not think of structural explanations as being valid. Well, what if we include Christian nationalism into those models? Does do those views of evangelical still hold, or is it really Christian nationalism that is explaining these things? Okay, so the purpose of the study. In this study, I use statistical analyses to um, assess the role of white Christian nationalism in perceptions of racial inequality. A second purpose will be to assess the unique importance of evangelical affiliation and Christian nationalism among white Americans. So important thing for this study, I'm only looking at white Americans. That's what Christian Smith's study was focusing on as well. Um, I do believe that it's important to have further studies that include everyone, but as a baseline, um, 
kind of uh, study in comparison to what Smith and Emerson and Smith had had previously done, I would like to also focus on uh, white Americans because they have unique perspectives when it comes to race and ethnicity. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the data and the methods. The data comes from the General Social Survey, the 1972 through 2018 General Social Survey. I'm actually only focusing on four years here. I'm looking at 1996, 2004, and 2014 because those were the only years that the variables I'm interested in were asked. So some measures, the dependent uh, variables. I have four dummy variables, meaning these variables are yes, no questions that were asked on the survey. So these are explanations for black, white income inequality. And one deals with biology, so differences due to inborn ability. One deals with culture, differences due to motivation. One deals with institutions, differences due to uh, equal access and opportunities of education. And one's due to history, which is discrimination. I also have uh, two independent variables that I'm focused on primarily. I have a dummy variable for evangelical affiliation, so evangelical affiliates versus other and no religious affiliates, and those who adhere to Christian nationalism versus those who do not. Christian nationalism defined as people who think it is a, it is very important for a real American to also be a Christian, uh, and that has been used in previous research. Uh, I'm going to cite Davis and Perry here. Um, so anyways, uh, those are the very key variables I'm looking at. I also have a slate of control variables such as um, sex and age, income, education, etc. Um, my analysis, I'm only looking at white respondents and I'm using multivariate regressions. So let's go ahead and jump in. The, the first thing I want to do is present some results on how Americans in uh, 1977, the first year, I guess I also used these years, uh, and how, 19, uh, how Americans viewed the racial wealth gap in 1977 through uh, as compared to 2018. So the blue bars here are the percentages that report in the affirmative in 1977. So in 1977, roughly one fourth of Americans thought that there is a wealth gap between white and black families or white and black Americans that could be explained by inborn ability. In other words, they thought that that was a reasonable reason to explain that. Um, we see in 2018, that number is down to 6%. So that is a pretty dramatic decrease. Note in both years, the beginning of the survey and the end of the survey, this is the least uh, popular explanation. But also important to note that while, it, you know, definitely that has changed probably the most of any measure from 1977 to 2018, there still is roughly one in 20 Americans who still do white Americans who believe that. Um, when it comes to motivation explaining the black white wealth gap, notice that in 1977, if you compare the blue bars, that was the most uh, popular or most reasonable explanation at, at roughly 65%, two thirds of American of, of white Americans believe that motivation could explain the wealth gap. And then in 2018, we saw that number decrease to a little under 40%. So while we see it's still a popular explanation or a common explanation, not definitely not the most common explanation. So um, Americans have become less individualistic over time in their views of structural inequality and structural cognition. If we look at the structural views, so first education opportunity, is access to education different between black and white Americans? Notice there's been hardly any change at all. So, and there's actually been a decrease, just a slight decrease, but it's non-significant, non-noticeable. Um, basically half of Americans in 1977 and 2018 think that access, white Americans think that access to education is a good or reasonable explanation for the wealth gap. And if we look at discrimination, which is more based on history, there has been a slight uptick in Americans believing that explanation, although it's hardly noticeable, still ranging right around 40%. Notice that in 2018, motivation and discrimination, one individual and one structural, have roughly the same amount of explanatory power for the black-white wealth gap, um, where the most popular explanation by a small margin is education. So that's where we are right now. Um, things have changed, especially with uh, how we think about individualistic explanations and individualistic cognition, um, not so much when it comes to structural. Okay, so what I'm going to be showing here is uh, results for binary logistic regressions. And if you're not a statistician, I'm going to break it down real quick. I know you're thinking I don't like stats, but okay, that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make this as painless as possible.
What these are, these are odds ratios. And let's look at just model one. Don't think about what it means right now. Let's just look at this number, 1.07. Here's how we interpret it. You take this number, the odds ratio, subtract 1, and you get 0 0.07 times 100 is positive 7. So what this means is that for evangelical Protestants are about 7% more likely than non-evangelicals to believe that um, inborn ability is an explanation for the wealth gap. I don't have any stars next to it like I do with some of the other numbers, and that means it's non-significant. So the important part about Model 1 here is that evangelicals are, just like Christian, Christian Smith said, evangelicals are no different than the rest of the United States in their views of inborn ability. So they do not believe that inborn ability, they're no different than anyone else in believing that inborn ability is a good explanation for the wealth gap. Now let's look at Christian nationalist or adherence to Christian nationalism. We get an odds ratio of 2.75. What that means is that Christian nationalists are a little more than two and a half times more likely to believe that inborn ability is a good explanation for the wealth gap compared to the rest of the country. Now, not compared to evangelicals, compared to non-Christian nationalists. So almost three times as likely. Then what I do is I model them together, and this allows me to control for one another. And what's interesting is we don't really see any change in evangelicals, again, non-significant. But what we do see is that Christian nationalists, it actually becomes slightly stronger, but essentially Christian nationalists are three times more likely than other white Americans to believe that differences in motivation are attributed to differences in inborn ability. And model four here, is the same as model three, but I bring in a slate of controls. And this will be important towards the end of this presentation. I control again for age and gender and education and income and where you grew up. Are you a Republican Democrat? How much do you go to church? Um, evangelical again, not significant, but Christian nationalists, I got a little plus here. What that means is it's um, low sample size, it's marginal significance. So um, my P value is less than 0 0.01, not less than 0 0.0, or less than 0 0.10, not less than 0 0.05. So um, due to low sample size, I'm going to say it's, it's, it's at least marginally significant. And we do see that Christian nationalists are about 59% more likely than other Americans to buy into the inborn ability argument. Let's look at the other individualistic argument. So this is due to lack of motivation. And this is something that Christian Smith had looked at uh, extensively. And as Smith um, found in his studies, evangelicals are significantly more likely than non-evangelicals to believe that wealth differences are due to motivation. So they're 64% more likely than non-evangelicals to believe that. Well, let's look at Christian nationalists. The effect is even stronger. Christian nationalists are more than twice as likely as non-Christian nationalists to believe that motivation, the culture, explains differences in the wage gap. When we model them together, we see that they are both still significant, although evangelical becomes slightly less significant, but the findings for Christian nationalism are quite robust. Christian nationalists are about 20%, or excuse me, not 20%, two times as likely to believe in the motivational argument. And then finally in model four, when we include all control variables, what we find is that evangelical affiliation and Christian nationalism are both significant. However, Christian nationalism is far more significant. So if you're Christian nationalist, uh, you're about uh, two thirds more likely to believe in the motivational argument. For evangelicals, you're about 44% more likely to believe. And that's controlling again for everything. So let's look at the results for structural explanation. So first off, do education differences in education opportunities explain the wealth gap? Well, we do have significant findings at first. So for evangelicals, um, we have to do some quick math here. 0.56 minus 1 is 0.44. That means that evangelicals are about 44% less likely than non-evangelicals to think that education opportunities are, are a good explanation for the wealth gap. For Christian nationalists, it's almost identical, 43% decrease. When we model them together, the effect decreases, but it's still, you know, both Christian nationalists and evangelicals, about 35% less likely uh, to buy into the idea that education opportunities are impactful. And then look what happens in model four. Now, both, it's identical. We get an odds ratio of 0.8, which means for both evangelicals and Christian nationalists, they're about 20% less likely to think that education can explain the wealth gap. But 
once we put in all of our controls, there are actually other controls that are far more substantial. So it, what this means is it doesn't have anything to do with being evangelical or being Christian nationalist. It's actually things like what we're going to find is age, Southern residents, those kinds of things that matter more. And then finally, can discrimination, this historical aspect um, of racism, can this explain differences in the wealth gap? Well, for evangelicals, yeah, about 30% less likely than the rest of the country to believe that discrimination matters. For Christian nationalists, about still about 22-23% less likely. When we model them together, only evangelical is significant. And then what's important here is model four. Again, we see no difference. So once we factor in all of the control variables, we know that it, that evangelicalism and Christian nationalism do not matter for structural cognition. Okay, so let's, uh, let's pull this all together. So first off, in the discussion, neither evangelical affiliation or Christian nationalism significantly impacted structural explanations. Um, that, it's interesting because that's something that Smith didn't find. And I, I think one of the reasons is because, you know, this is more of a stats issue, but Christian nationalism was eating up some of that, that variance um, that, that would explain evangelicals' resistance to um, structural explanations. But um, what, it, what it does mean and what it, what it means to me is that in general, these things are, they're unique, the, that Christian nationalism and evangelical affiliation are uh, unique. They mean something different. And even though they overlap a lot, they should be treated as different. Um, Christian nationalism was a stronger predictor of individual explanations compared to evangelical affiliation, especially interesting when it came to differences in inborn ability. Motivation, yes, but inborn ability, we, you know, one of the things that Smith wanted to emphasize is that evangelicals don't see people of different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds is different. That's not true for Christian nationalists, and that presents a problem when we want to think about inequality. Um, it's also really important when we think about evangelical Protestants uh, within a political context. So um, one of the biggest questions that was posed after the 2016 election was, why would evangelical Christians who, you know, during Bill Clinton's time as president said things like character counts and morality matters, and then they support Donald Trump, who has, you know, a lot of moral deficiencies, according to some, many. Um, well, it's what, what, what uh, Whitehead and Perry find is that it's not evangelical Christians. It's actually Christian nationalism. People who adhere to Christian nationalism really like Donald Trump. They also tended to be evangelical, but we found plenty of examples of evangelicals who were not Christian nationalists who really didn't like a lot of the things that Donald Trump was saying and didn't want to support Donald Trump. So those two things are unique predictors and they need to be treated as such. Another important finding was that in all models, age and Southern residents increased individual and decreased structural explanations. So what does this mean? This means that the older you get, and especially for Southerners, they, those individuals who were older in Southern um, really preferred the individual explanations, either the cultural or the biological explanations, far more so than the rest of the country. So people in the South, far more, far more than anywhere else. Older people, far more than younger people. And we also see that in every single case, as you get older, or if you live in the South, you're more skeptical of structural explanations. So more likely to downplay the role of history and traditions. For Southerners, that makes a lot of sense given um, our history. Uh, and when it comes to age, I think in, in a lot of ways that signifies kind of a changing of the guard, if you want to think about it. We are finding that younger generations, even as they age, are changing their social views in very important ways. We've seen a lot of change in generations when it comes to support for um, racial organizations or, or organizations dealing with racial issues such as Black Lives Matter. Um, there's a huge, huge chasm when it comes to support amongst Zoomers and Millennials versus Gen Xers and Baby Boomers. Uh, but we see the same thing for issues like gay and lesbian rights as well, right? And from 1990 to 2020, there's been huge shifts in public opinion. And what's interesting is it's not older Americans who tend to be changing their views. It's that new Americans 
are becoming adults and they're taking surveys and we call that cohort replacement. So those newer people bring in new ideas and we start seeing the country change slowly, but change over time. Um, and finally, uh, oh, I also want to mention education. This was um, something I really wanted to highlight. In every single model, education was the strongest predictor, but it moved in the opposite direction of Southern residents and age. Education above anything else was profoundly instrumental in reducing individualistic cognition of racial inequality and at the same time promoting structural cognition. And my indicator was just, do you have a bachelor's degree or not? So to me, that, that says there is power in a college degree. Just having that college degree, I think in most cases, made you three times more likely to want to prefer a structural explanation versus those who did who had less than a bachelor's degree. So colleges and higher uh, and, and, and institutions of higher learning are doing a great job of bringing about or bringing to light structural issues in ways that people want to apply in their lives. Okay, and finally, I wanted to talk about this. Nationalism operates uniquely from theology. And if there's anything I want to finish this, this talk with, it's this, that national, Christian nationalism is a political ideology. It is not a theological stance. Yes, the, there are major aspects of Christianity wrapped in it. It's called Christian nationalism. But at the end of the day, it is a political ideology, not a theological proposition. So the cognitive interweaving of Christian and American identity strongly influence those in and out group cultural boundaries. Um, I think Christian nationalism needs to be studied in, in future studies, especially when we're looking at differences between evangelical Protestants and other Americans. Um, that, that line of research is becoming very, very popular, and it, it's having a resurgence again. And I think it would be inadvisable and we'd be amiss if we didn't factor in this ideology when we're also thinking about um, the ways that evangelicals express themselves politically and socially but also anything that deals with um, that in and out group uh, moral boundaries that that we've seen throughout research is, is very very important and if we want to think about you know moving forward in, in terms of um, just society in general, the rights of people of color, of women, of, of um, LGBTQIA folks, it's also important to understand structural cognition because that gives you an idea, kind of a glimpse of how do people understand the issue? And if you understand, you know, if we have a glimpse of how they understand the issue, then we have a better chance of figuring out how can we move the needle forward. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to hear what I had to say today and share my research. Even if you're not a stats person, it's a lot of fun for me to, to explain. Um, you can get a hold of me. I'm sure my email will be available through the conference program. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Again, thanks for the time today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.